Although, although the self-terminators succeeded in damaging eight American ships, mostly destroyers and destroyer escorts of the radar picket line, as well as some smaller craft, and causing high casualties. Only one warship was sunk, the new picket destroyer Manert el Abele, the first eliminate on record by a Baca bomb. Abel was on picket station 14 about 30 miles west of Okinawa when it was jumped by a pair of self-termination vowels. Abel's anti-aircraft opened up, each burst seemingly scoring a hit but with the planes reappearing through the smoke. One of the attackers was sent into the sea, but the second struck the destroyer's after-engine room, spreading death and destruction and causing a bell to buckle visibly. Just then, one of two Betty bombers circling like scavengers overhead released its backer bomb, which came shrieking at the stricken destroyer at 500 knots. The pilot kept his missile perfectly on course, striking a bell exactly amidships. A tremendous blast lifted the American out of the water to be slammed back again. Many men were blown overboard, among them Lieutenant George Ray, who swam back to his ship, clambering aboard to tear open a jammed escape hatch allowing the entire watch of the forward engine room to scramble to safety. In less than another minute, Ray might have been too late, for Abel sank five minutes after the Barker struck. Most of her officers and crew were rescued by a nearby landing ship medium, but six men were eliminated and 73 missing. Simultaneous with the agony of Abel, a flight of conventional kamikaze found Rear Admiral Deo's gunfire support force patrolling waters off the Motobu Peninsula. When they struck, Deo fortunately had his ships concentrated and they were ready for the divine winds, which could do little more than stagger a destroyer and crash a 40mm mount aboard battleship Tennessee. One sailor who was blown into the air landed atop a 5-inch gun turret, where he crouched while calmly stripping off his burning clothing to await a cold bath from the nearest fire hose. Marine Corporal W. H. Putnam either fell or was blown overboard, surfacing near a big life raft. He clambered aboard, finding unusual company in the presence of the headless torso of the kamikaze who had crashed his ship. Thus, the scourging of the American fleet off Okinawa continued unabated. But once again, the kamikaze had failed to strike the paralyzing blow so eagerly sought by Admiral Ugaki. Losses among the self-terminators are not exactly known, although 185 of them had participated in the assault. An enormous decline from the 355 making the first attacks. The decrease would continue until on June 21 to 22, Ugaki could scrape together only 45 decrepit divine winds the shriveled petals remaining on the deadly floating chrysanthemums. Triumphs of logistics, though impressive, usually do not make rattling good reading, as one British historian wrote of the Napoleonic Wars. Yet the industrial and logistics feat of the United States of America, fighting the first great two-ocean war on record, is unrivaled in the history of humankind. And at Okinawa during the culminating Battle of the Island War, as well as the greatest amphibious operation in military annals, the Americans had to overcome two unprecedented challenges. First, it had to supply this unrivaled sea invasion at a distance of 7,500 miles from its western shores. Second, it had to keep a fleet unsurpassed in numbers of ships and firepower constantly at sea for weeks at a time, while feeding it with ammunition, food, fuel, airplanes, including those myriad lesser demands of an invader engaged on land and sea and in the air. Even more than Admiral Spruance's 5th Fleet and Mitcher's Task Force 58, General Buckner's 10th Army was a monster of consumption. Between April 1 and 16 alone, no less than 577,000 tonnes of supplies were landed on the Hagushi beaches, a record achieved in the face of two destructive storms and the attacks of the kamikaze. A difficulty unsuspected by the iceberg planners, though actually a happy one, was the incredible speed of the advance of Buckner's attacking divisions, so rapid that ducks and amphibious tractors expecting to haul their supplies no farther than the beaches were obliged to roll far inland to unload. Another problem caused by unforeseen success was that because planners had placed the unloading priority of spare vehicles lower than such vital supplies as ammunition, barbed wire, fuel and food, these first priority supplies had to be heaped on the beaches to get at the now sorely needed jeeps and trucks. This caused the breakdown of an elaborate plan for supply dumps to be established at carefully selected points.
Night unloading under floodlights, suspended only during air raid alerts, helped to unload waiting ships speedily, but also added to beach congestion. On April 13, General Buckner was dismayed to learn that during the past 24 hours, only 640 tonnes of artillery ammunition had crossed the beaches, not nearly enough to supply guns expending more shells than planners had anticipated. Buckner immediately gave priority to artillery shells, and in the next few days 3,000 tonnes daily were deposited ashore, enough not only for those tireless guns, but also to begin building a reserve. Okinawa's excellent network of bad roads, all narrow and lightly surfaced, could not be traversed by American armoured tractors and 6x6 trucks. Those early April rainstorms that had delayed unloading of ships also made the roads softer, compelling American engineers to try to harden them with sand mixed with coral. But the coral was not easy to dig and had to be blasted frequently. Without a rock crusher, the engineers sometimes dumped coral fragments as big as boulders on the roads, turning some of them into obstacle courses. Erection of numerous pontoon causeways from the reefs to solid ground helped ease the continuing problem of moving supplies from ship to shore. Landing craft, tank and landing ship mediums could tie up to the small ones, transferring their cargo directly into trucks. The bigger ships at the bigger causeways used cranes. Red Beach 1, opposite Yontan Airfield, had the largest causeway, 1,428 feet long with a pierhead 45 by 175 feet. During the first few days, 60,000 men and 110,000 tonnes of cargo crossed the piers. The most serious shortage was in shells for the 81mm mortars, those unlovely stovepipes that probably have eliminated more soldiers than any other weapon devised, caused by the loss to Kamikaze April 6 of those two ammunition ships. But the ever-resourceful Admiral Turner quickly put in an emergency request to Guam, and 117 tonnes of mortar shells were airlifted to Okinawa, enough to keep the stovepipes firing until many more tonnes could arrive by ship. Yontan and Kadena airfields were kept so well supplied that not a single plane was grounded for lack of fuel during the entire campaign. Fifth Fleet and Task Force 58 were supplied by a force of cargo ships and oilers, commanded by Rear Admiral D.G. Beery from his flagship in the old light cruiser Detroit. When Beery received requests from carrier groups for oil and ammunition, he would send formations of the necessary ships hurrying to the flat-top fleets to begin replenishment at dawn and complete it by dusk. Long before Okinawa, the Navy had perfected the system of refueling at sea, and eventually replacement ships were trained to fill the carrier's every need. Even such bulky items as crated airplane engines or jeeps for use on flight decks. Weapons, bombs and bullets were soon added, and thus at Okinawa Task Force 58 could remain almost indefinitely at sea. This is a fact that might be a boon to Admiral Mitcher but a bore to his swab jockeys weary of sea duty and eager for a little fun ashore. In the immemorial rhythm of for want of a nail a shoe was lost, the most serious problem was inadequate supplies of 3.5 and 4-inch manila line, and this would not be solved until the Philippines were completely reconquered. Supply of the bombardment warships off Okinawa was made easy by Admiral Turner's foresight in seizing the Keramas, not only for a ship's hospital, but also to keep the big naval guns bellowing. A new class of landing ship tank ammunition ships equipped with mobile cranes shuttling between the Keramas and Ulithi and the Marianas was able to deposit cargoes directly onto the decks of bombardment warships. They also were type-loaded, that is, carrying ammunition for just one class of ship, say, 5 inches, and 40 mm for destroyers. Fuel for all these ships together with about a thousand carrier aircraft was supplied both by Admiral Barry and fleet tankers sailing from Guam to Okinawa or meeting thirsty ships at sea. Two huge fleet tankers left Guam every three days. Every day during the peak period of April 4th to 24th, an average of 167,042 gallon barrels of fuel oil was consumed by the ships at and around Okinawa plus 385,000 gallons of aviation gasoline. By May 27th, nearly 9 million barrels of oil had been consumed and 21 million gallons of aviation gasoline. To say nothing of the delivery of less vital but still important items as 2,700,000 packages of cigarettes, 1,200,000 candy bars 
and over 24 million pieces of mail to gladden the heart of American servicemen there. Suggestive of the extent of the logistical triumph occurring at the Great Lu Chu was the fact that four escort carriers were employed to protect replacement planes and pilots being ferried to the battle area. This with 17 more on the same mission between the West Coast and the Marianas. Aside from the loss of those two ammunition ships, Japan's naval and air forces did next to nothing to interfere with this enormous supply pipeline, because Admiral Barry's fleet operated about 200 miles south of Okinawa with air cover from two escort carriers, it was rarely attacked. One lone kamikaze did score a hit on the fleet oiler Toluga, but this minor damage was quickly repaired. The failure of the Japanese counter-attack on April 12-13 had convinced Major General John Hodge that the time had come for a major breakthrough in Ushijima's Nahashuri Yonabaru line. It was scheduled for April 19. In the interval, the 77th Infantry Division landed on Ie Shima, just off the western tip of Motobu Peninsula, about to fall to the 6th Marine Division. Ie was a fair-sized island with a completed airfield. Landing on April 16, the 77th fought a savage four-day battle, eliminating 4,706 Japanese, many or perhaps even most of them uniformed civilians, while losing 258 soldiers eliminated or missing and 879 wounded. Marching with the 77th was Ernie Pyle. Before Pyle left Ulithi to join the 1st Marine Division, another correspondent yelled at him jokingly, Keep your head down, Ernie! Snorting in disdain, the G.I.'s friend replied, Listen, you, I'll take a drink over every one of your graves. But it was Ernie's last resting place that was dug on Ishima. As it always was with Pyle, he was at the front, driving there with a battalion commander. Suddenly a Japanese machine gun opened up, and the driver with his two passengers dived into a ditch. After the machine gun fell silent, the commander and Pyle raised their heads, and the gun chattered again. Pyle slumped back into the ditch. Bullets had entered his forehead just below his helmet. Over his grave, his new comrades in the Pacific placed a monument with the inscription, On this spot, the 77th Infantry Division lost a buddy, Ernie Pyle, 18 April, 1945. Two days later, the defending Japanese mounted a desperate counter-attack in an effort to recover ground lost during April 20 to the Americans. After dark that night, infiltrators in company strength and in small groups, a total of about 500 men, launched a screeching assault on the front of the 307th Infantry's G Company. Many of them penetrated, actually overrunning a battalion command post, and might have broken through but for the efforts of two machine gunners, Staff Sergeant Anthony Tsunowski and Private First Class Martin May. Both men emptied their heavy machine guns repeatedly until they had no more belts left after which they struck at the enemy with grenades and carbines, until May was wounded by a mortar shell and the enemy driven off. They returned to the attack and once again May fought them off, but this time he received his mortal wound and his Medal of Honour was awarded posthumously. On the following day, General Hodges' bellowing, three-division assault began. Its objective was to penetrate defences around Shuri to seize the low valley and highway linking Yonabaru on the east coast with the capital of Naha on the west. Admirals Spruance and Turner were eager to seize Naha with its excellent port, the very harbour in which Commodore Perry had cast his anchors en route to opening Japan to world trade. Even though General Hodge was hopeful, he had no illusions about the formidable positions that his troops would be attacking. It is going to be really tough he said. There are 65,000 to 70,000 fighting Japanese holed up in the south end of the island, and I see no way to get them out except blast them out yard by yard. He also said that because he faced a bristling front without flanks stretching from the Pacific Ocean on the east to the East China Sea on the west, there was simply no opportunity for large-scale manoeuvre. Instead, Nahashuri Yonabaru had to be cracked by weight of metal. All previous Pacific war bombardments were surpassed by the concentration of explosives, land, sea and air that preceded the attack. Twenty-seven battalions of army and marine artillery ranging from 105mm to 8-inch howitzers. 354 pieces in all produced a barrage of 75 pieces per mile, the proportion increasing as the array moved from east to west. 
bursting on the enemy with a horrible roar at dawn of the 19th, a rain of howling shells struck Japanese emplacements for 20 minutes to the front of the 7th and 96th Divisions. Six battleships, six cruisers, and nine destroyers firing on call thickened the cannonade with projectiles ranging up to 1,800 pounds. While 650 Navy and Marine aircraft either flew close-up air support for the waiting troops, or punished the enemy's outposts and Ushijima's Shuri headquarters with rockets and 1,000-pound bombs, Meanwhile, troops boated in transports covered by planes and warships made another feint at the Minotoga beaches in the south, hoping to draw off some of the enemy's strength. But Ushijima was not deceived and gave no such orders. Instead, he reiterated his instructions to all commanders to keep their men safely below ground. Needless to say, they were strictly obeyed even when after its opening 20-minute explosions. The American artillery lifted its fire to begin pummeling the rear areas for ten minutes. While American troops fainted at the Japanese front, hoping to deceive the Japanese into believing the bombardment had ceased and thus lure them above ground. But they still remained invisible, so that when their enemy's fire returned to their front again, no one was caught above ground. Actually, few Japanese were eliminated and wounded by this massive artillery assault, even though 19,000 shells had been fired at them. Brigadier General Joseph Sheets, commanding 24th Corps Artillery, said that he doubted that as many as 190 Japanese, one for every 100 shells, had been eliminated in the bombardment. Nevertheless, the assault went forward and began to measure its gains in yards. At the outset, all seemed well. Major General George Griner's 27th Division, entering Okinawa combat for the first time, had been assigned a pre-dawn assault on the extreme right flank of the 24th's front. Greiner hoped to outflank the enemy by a night attack, having read a captured 62nd Division intelligence report stating the enemy generally fires during the night, but very seldom takes offensive action then. In his night attack, Greiner would have to cross Makinato Inlet, and to do this would need to construct bridges and improve the road leading to the water. This could not be done by day, for the Japanese had complete observation of the terrain north of the Urasomura escarpment, so the bridges were built farther back, and the engineers trained in assembling them and breaking them down. Meanwhile, a bulldozer was assigned to widen and repair the narrow, shell-pocked little jeep road leading to the inlet. By day, in full view of the enemy, the bulldozer retrieved upended or mired jeeps. By night, the driver worked tirelessly to make the road passable for Griner's troops. Thus. Before dawn of the 19th, the 27th spearheads did indeed cross Makinato Inlet unseen. With dawn, however, they were detected, and a rain of fire struck them to the ground and kept them there. This was the high point of Hodge's massive three-division assault. All that the night attack had achieved was to allow the Americans to move undetected over the low ground, intervening between their jump-off point and their objective. Elsewhere, the assault did not even get that close. It had been hoped that the new flamethrowing tank assigned to the 7th Division on the left flank would easily destroy Ushijima's outposts. In essence, the new weapon was an old Sherman tank with a flame spout projecting from inside the barrel of its 75mm cannon. It fired a stream of fiery fluid of mixed napalm and gasoline. The napalm was a soapy, granular, flammable substance that would stick like jelly to whatever it hit. Tanks, pillboxes and men... The flamethrower was the only weapon that terrified the Japanese. First widely used on Peleliu, it was usually carried by a big strong man firing a tube connected to a tank on his back. It sometimes backfired, for a bullet could ignite the tank, incinerating everyone in the vicinity, while charring the man who fired it. Adapted to a tank, it was thought to be much harder to stop than a man. It seemed so when three of these flame-belching monsters and two regular tanks joined the Seventh's attack and clanked toward the coastal flats dotted with fortified tombs and pillboxes beneath Skyline Ridge. Long, hissing jets of orange flame issued from the mouths of the 75s directed into every opening. Soon clouds of greasy black smoke billowed skyward, and the G.I.s, who had been watching in fascination at this incineration of their enemies, cheered wildly. Now possessing a foothold below, the Americans began climbing the ridge, straight into an enemy hurricane. First, pre-registered mortars fell upon them, flashing and crashing. And then, boiling over the crest of the ridge, 
charging up from the reverse slope, and even rushing into their own mortars to close with the enemy, came a horde of screaming Japanese hurling grenades and satchel charges. Twice they came in counterattacks, and each time the GIs clung desperately to their weakening hold on the forward slope. Higher up on Skyline Ridge, other soldiers of the 7th advanced unmolested for 500 yards, an ominously easy ascent that should have warned them. But when they moved into ground also pre-registered, the same rain of enemy fire stopped them cold. Pinned down throughout the day, all formations of the 7th were retreating into their former positions by shortly after four o'clock. They had gained not a yard. In the centre of Hodge's assault, the 96th Division found its experience even more frustrating than the 7th's. The objective was the Tanabaru Nishibaru Ridge Line, which joined Skyline Ridge, Hill 178, and Kakazu Ridge to form the zone defended by General Fujioka's 62nd Division. Repeated local attacks gained no more than outpost ground. Only one serious attempt to penetrate enemy defences was made, by a platoon led by First Lieutenant Lawrence O'Brien of Colonel Mickey Finn's 32nd Regiment. O'Brien tried to move on to Skyline Ridge and thence westward to the towering mass of Hill 178. Apart from an exploding shell that eliminated one man and wounded three others, O'Brien's men moved rapidly up Skyline's steep forward slope, then swung right toward 178. A Japanese machine gun chattered, and the Americans took refuge in an abandoned pillbox. From a ridge above, the Japanese hurled grenades and fired knee mortars. O'Brien was pinned down. Major John Connor, the battalion commander, sent a platoon to the rescue, but this unit also came under enemy fire, so scourging that only six men of the platoon returned to base alive and unwounded. With this, Connor recalled O'Brien. In another demonstration of how dangerous the forward slopes of the ridges could be with the rear slopes unconquered, Connor had lost 80 men and gained not an inch. After that first quick nighttime surge over unoccupied ground on the 24th's right flank, the 27th Division's sector became a burial ground for American armour. Because the division's foot soldiers failed to penetrate Kakazu's defences, the tanks, 30 of them including three armoured flamethrowers, and self-propelled 105mm howitzers had no supporting infantry. This left them exposed to the plunging fire of enemy 47mm anti-tank guns above them, and the infiltration tactics of Nipponese self-termination squads hurling satchel charges, usually against the vehicle's bottom plate. Unfortunately for the Yankee tankers, the Japanese at Kakazu were actually waiting for them, praying for them. One 47mm gunner named Fujio Takeda knocked out five tanks with six shots at 400 yards. In all, of the 30 American tanks that attacked, only eight survived. Many of the tankers lived, most of them digging holes beneath their disabled steel monsters and remaining in them undetected for as long as three days. Others were eliminated when the Japanese pried open their turret lids and dropped grenades in. It was thus that General Hodge's hurricane attack was hurled back. Failing utterly to break through, it did not obtain a single lodgment or foothold in the enemy's defences, from which further assaults might be mounted. Possibly worse, General Greiner, in his decision to bypass Kakazu Ridge, had left a gap of almost a mile between his 27th Division and the 96th in the centre. No American troops were there to blunt any enemy counterattack and so General Hodge worried that a Japanese counter-strike could slip through to trap the entire 27th, pressing it against the iron enemy defences it had failed to pierce, and there destroy it. Fortunately, those well-entrenched Japanese were as blind as the moles they resembled, having no idea of their foe's whereabouts, and no enemy counter-attack was launched. Nevertheless, General Greiner the next day reiterated his belief that the Japanese strongpoints should be bypassed and mopped up. In reply, Colonel Screaming Mike Halloran, commander of the 381st Infantry, gave a more accurate estimate of the enemy's troops. You cannot bypass a Japanese because a Japanese does not know when he is bypassed. Thus ended the hurricane assault with 24th Corps losses totaling 750 eliminated, missing and wounded. It was an entirely different American infantryman who wearily and warily greeted the dawn of April 20 on Okinawa. Up until the fiery failure at Kakazu during April 12 to 13, and the bloody repulse of April 19 at Shuri's outer defences.
The Army infantry in the Pacific, apart from a few isolated instances and during only two major battles, Saipan and Guam, had been fighting a war in which manoeuvre was possible. These were on the great land mass of New Guinea, the second largest island in the world, and the Philippine archipelago with its thousands of islands big and small. In these campaigns, manoeuvre was not only possible but mandatory if casualties were to be kept minimal. And the enemy being attacked was usually fighting from log and mud fortifications, half naked and half starved by the effectiveness with which the submarines and warships of the United States Navy had severed their supply lines. The casualties were indeed minimal, as the boastful Douglas MacArthur would trumpet to the world in his tireless pursuit of supreme command in the Pacific. And the army infantry had few, if any, days such as the crucibles at Kakazu and before Shuri. But now, though dimly, the GIs realised that they had come to their own Tarawa, Peleliu or Iwo Jima with their fortifications of steel, concrete and coral. Including interconnected by mazes of tunnels with interlocking fire and all approaches pre-registered by every weapon. They now knew, as the Marines in the Central Pacific had learned, that enormous massed bombardment of these truly formidable defences from sea, air and land was usually if not always no more effective than a smokescreen. True, they would cause some casualties, but never enough to be decisive, and the accident of a lucky hit could never be repeated on call. Only the impetuous foot soldier slashing in with his hand weapons and using tanks, hurling explosives and aiming flame, can succeed in a war against armed and resolute moles. The naval shell's flat trajectory, the bomb's broad parabola, the artillery projectile's arc, even the loop of the mortar cannot chase such moles down a tunnel. If they can occasionally collapse the whole position with a direct hit, a rare feat, they have knocked out only one spoke in the enemy's wheel. But the wheel still turns, eliminating and maiming, and again in the absence of that military miracle, direct hits on call, the man on foot has to go in, too often even without his tanks. Moreover, the losses in armour and the casualties among the American GIs on that near-disastrous April 19 were not only the result of attacks made into Ushijima's clever and sometimes invisible defences, spouting death and destruction. But they were also complicated by the terrain of southern Okinawa itself. It was, as the army's official history states, ground utterly without pattern. It was a confusion of little mesa-like hilltops, deep draws, rounded clay hills, gentle green valleys, bare and ragged coral ridges, lumpy mounds of earth, narrow ravines and sloping finger ridges extending downward from the hill masses. On April 20, General Hodge's three-division assault into Ushijima's meat grinder was renewed, 7th on left, 96th in the centre, and 27th on the right. In these first two formations, the GIs, now thoroughly blooded in this type of warfare, moved forward more warily and skilfully. The 32nd Infantry of the 7th, or Hourglass, took Uki Hill with surprising ease, and then struck at Skyline Ridge, blanketing it with smoke to blind the numerous enemy mortarmen there. The tactic worked, especially after two gallant soldiers, First Lieutenant John Holmes and Staff Sergeant James McCarthy, led a final charge to seize the hill, but later perished in a fierce enemy counterattack that was hurled back. Flame-throwing tanks were of major assistance in this action, burning out a forward mortar position that could have been troublesome. But the skyline's dogged defenders did not submit so tamely. One machine gunner in a pillbox was particularly tenacious until Sergeant Theodore MacDonnell, a mortar observer not expected to join a battle, entered the struggle on his own, charging the pillbox, throwing grenades. Next, he borrowed a Browning automatic rifle, and when that jammed, a carbine, rushing the enemy position with this ordinarily most useless weapon in the American arsenal. At close range, however, it could do damage, and MacDonnell used it to eliminate all three gunners. Then, his Celtic blood aroused, he picked up the enemy gun and heaved it down the embankment, followed by a knee mortar. Without pausing to thank MacDonnell for this distinguished favour, one of Colonel Finn's companies proceeded to clear Skyline at a cost of two eliminated and eleven wounded. Hill 178 now came under American fire, and after two days, patrols blasting enemy caves found these positions stuffed with corpses. Two hundred in one, a hundred in another, fifty in a third, and forty-five in a fourth. Those who had survived had been withdrawn.
The 184th Infantry's objective was the Rocky Crags, two coral pinnacles that had to be taken before Towering Hill 178 could be assaulted, but no headway was made the first day. Dismayed, General Arnold came to the front to study these obstacles. Deciding that the crags could be fragmented by direct artillery fire, he ordered a 155mm howitzer up front, setting up on a knoll 800 yards away and firing over open sights, the crew's first missile, a 95-pound shell with a hardened tip and a concrete-piercing fuse, sent a hefty chunk of coral flying into the air. Seven more destructive shots so upset the Japanese that they sprayed the knoll with machine gun fire. Two men were wounded, and the survivors quickly dug a hole for their gun. Now unseen, assisted by other guns and flame-throwing tanks, the Americans literally shot both crags into smithereens until both collapsed on themselves. To the seventh's right, the 96th struck at three ridges, Tanabaru Nishibaru Tombstone. It took two days of savage fighting to clear Tombstone and to advance to the crest of Nishibaru. On the night of April 21 to 22, the Japanese counter-attacked three times against a battalion of the 382nd commanded by Lieutenant Franklin Hartline. In one charge, Staff Sergeant David Dovell lifted his machine gun to fire it at the enemy full trigger, severely burning his hands on the red-hot barrel. Dovell was also wounded in both legs, but survived. Meanwhile, soldiers firing light or 60mm mortars elevated their small stovepipes to a dangerously close 86 degrees, dropping shells only 30 yards to their front. Colonel Hartline joined the battle, throwing grenades and firing the weapons of the fallen. At 3.15am the Japanese retreated, leaving 198 dead comrades behind. Tanabaru now lay temporarily open, and it was Captain Hoss Mitchell's Lardises who seized the opportunity. Its earlier losses filled by replacements, the company fought a savage hand-grenade battle that lasted nearly four hours, until Mitchell, with three grenades and a carbine, rushed the crest to wipe out a machine-gun nest. By nightfall of April 23, the 96th held its objectives securely, though it had paid a bloody price of 99 eliminated and 19 missing with a staggering 660 wounded. Even so, the success of the 7th and 96th clearly indicated to General Hodge that Ushijima's outer line was cracking. Soldiers of the 27th on the 20th, except for two companies that panicked and fled in disorder when they blundered into an enemy position, were not quite so careful as their comrades in the centre and left, probably because they had had a comparatively easy time of it on April 19. Still on the right flank, the New Yorkers moved confidently against a position called Item Pocket, unaware that it was probably Ushijima's toughest and most cleverly designed fortification. Its name derived from its presence in the eye, or item, grid square on the American tactical map. It consisted of coral and limestone ridges running like spokes on a wheel from a swale at its centre. Against it came two battalions of Colonel Gerard Kelly's 165th Infantry, the first commanded by Lieutenant Colonel James Mahoney on the left, and the second under Lieutenant Colonel John McDonough on the right. Resisting them was Lieutenant Colonel Kosuka Nishibayashi's 21st Independent Infantry Battalion of about 600 soldiers together with two or three hundred Okinawan conscripts. All had been working for months on items' defences, which they called Gusukuma after a nearby town. There was no safe way to approach the position. Because two bridges on Highway 1 had been knocked out, tanks could not menace it. Every ridge was protected by mortars with machine guns, zeroed in from others. Tunnels ran beneath the ridges with openings on either side and on the top. Thus, each ridge was a kakazu in miniature, abundantly stocked with food, ammunition and water. Until Item fell, there could be no real progress south. No real attempt to penetrate Item was made on the first day. But on the night of the 21st, a detail of eight men from McDonough's battalion led by Technical Sergeant Ernest Schoaf tried to seize a ridge in a night attack and provoked one of the wildest fights of the Okinawa campaign. Forty to fifty Japanese screaming banzai and hurling grenades charged them from about forty yards away. Scrambling into foxholes that they had dug, Schoaf's men fought back with grenades of their own, rifle shots, rifle butts, even hurling rocks. Private First Class Paul Cook took out ten of the enemy before being eliminated himself, and when they closed for hand-to-hand -hand fighting, 
Shof broke his M1 rifle over one enemy's head, grabbed an Arisaka rifle from another's hands to bayonet him, and then shot a third mushroom-helmeted assailant. Wisely, the GIs made a fighting withdrawal, counting only two of their own dead and another missing. Such fierce local encounters would characterise the item pocket fighting lasting until April 25, and it was a company led by Captain Bernard Ryan that finally broke through the stubborn item barrier. On the 25th, Ryan with two platoons climbed a key ridge and was savagely attacked by Japanese trying to drive them off. But they held, and then, assisted by other companies, began clearing the ridge to turn item's seaward flank. Nevertheless, resistance continued until April 28, when Highway 1 was finally opened to southbound American traffic. Now Griner's troops began to extend their grasp on the Urasso Mura escarpment's western flank, suffering so severely that the division's losses rose above 500 during a single day. By the morning of April 24, the western end of the Urasso Mura escarpment was in American hands. Only Kakazu in Ushijima's outer defences remained unconquered. Hoping to reduce that stubborn position, Hodge formed a special attack force under Brigadier General William Bradford, the 27th's assistant division commander. Called Bradford Force, it was to strike Kakazu early on the 24th. But that night, during a heavy fog, a powerful enemy artillery barrage struck the American forward elements. When Bradford Force attacked, its men found to their amazement that there was little or no resistance. Under cover of the fog and the bombardment, the wily Ushijima had ordered a general retreat to preserve his remaining strength. For five days since April 19, the Japanese had fought a dogged defensive battle, limiting the Americans' gains to yards and at Kakazu stopping them in their tracks. But by darkness of April 23, the line had been pierced in so many places that it was in danger of collapsing with a consequent loss of many men, either by enemy action or self-terminator. So General Ushijima withdrew to his next chain of defences. In effect, the battle for southern Okinawa had advanced but a single, solid step, with many more steps to follow. Major General Curtis LeMay had been in command of the 20th Air Force since the summer of 1944. At 39, this burly flyer, so big he could barely fit into a fighter cockpit, was anxious to apply his theories of incendiary bombing with the new B-29 Superfortress bomber, then coming off the production lines. It was not until February 1945, however, that he had enough of these gigantic aircraft to stage a major firebombing raid, this time on Kobe and with such excellent results that an ecstatic LeMay prepared for the monster March 9 strike at Tokyo that became the most destructive air raid in history. Now believing, like all those bomber barons so detested by Dwight Eisenhower, that his command alone might bring Nippon to her knees, LeMay was not happy to be ordered to concentrate on the enemy airbases on Kyushu in support of the Okinawa operation. From April 16 onward, the superforts hammered the kamikaze airfields, while their chief, speaking in language customarily garbled by the cigar or pipe clenched between his teeth, appealed to General H. H. Hap Arnold, chief of the United States Army Air Force, for permission to resume strategic bombing. It was not granted, if only because Fleet Admiral Nimitz had been able to convince the Joint Chiefs that the immediate short-range effects of punishing the self-terminator bases would in the long run prove more valuable than the long-range results of strategic bombing. So the superforts continued to strike the Kyushu fields, even though Admiral Ugaki frequently used all the late model fighters at his disposal in an effort to destroy them. This was not quite possible, for his interceptors had neither the speed nor the firepower necessary to take out a superfort. Nevertheless, some vicious aerial duels developed high in the skies. One of the most fierce erupted on April 27 when a hundred B-29s attacked Kanoya and five other airfields. There were so many Japanese fighters aloft and buzzing the big bombers that Lieutenant Kenneth Hornbeck later told war correspondents, the milk run is over, the cream is curdled. Lieutenant Philip Van Schuyler reported, They must have made a hundred attacks on the eleven B-29s that I saw, and thirty on our four-plane section. One crippled superfort flying out of formation was pounced on by four enemy fighters releasing white phosphorus bombs across its path. By skilful manoeuvre, the stricken aircraft broke clear. Four fighters fell, and one superfort was lost. On the following day, 
American gunners using their electronic computing gun sights claimed to have shot down 36 Japanese fighters together with 13 probables. Again, a B-29 was lost. Using the tactics of pattern bombing, the Americans blanketed the Kyushu fields with fragmentation and demolition bombs, cratering runways and taxiways, riddling everything erect and destroying revetments. They also struck at hangars and shops filled with planes under repair while mangling irreplaceable tools. Japanese fighters compelled to land wherever they could on Kyushu became so scattered that Ugaki and Sugahara found it almost impossible to assemble them for concentrated flights intended to clear the Okinawa skies for the following kamikaze. Thus, many more self-terminators than usual were exposed to the stuttering guns of naval and marine flyers off the carriers. And more frequently, the marine corsairs based at Yontan and Kadena. Nevertheless, Ugaki and Sugahara managed to put together Kikusui-4, scheduled for two main attacks April 27 and 28, and a preliminary on April 22. LeMay's attacks continued into May, and although a total of 24 superforts were lost, with 233 damaged, the enemy's losses in fighters, though never known exactly, were certainly astronomical. Moreover, the superforts achieved their objective in crippling the aerial fleets of Admiral Ugaki and General Sugahara. As often happens, either because of luck, enemy indolence or favourable weather, the prelim was more destructive than the main bout. Twenty Navy and forty-six Army kamikaze came diving out of a haze, concealing them from the gunners on the Hagushi ships. One crashed and sank a landing craft and another capsized the minesweeper Swallow. A third struck destroyer Isherwood among its depth charges aft, setting off a monster explosion that mangled the tin can's stern and sent it crawling slowly toward Kerama. Two other destroyers suffered minor damage. There might have been much more destruction at Hagushi but for the marine pilots at Kadena and Yontan. They reported 36 eliminations, mostly among unskillful young self-terminators unable to evade their attacks. Major George Axtell on his first combat mission over the Great Lu Chu became an ace in one flight, shooting down five vals. On April 27 and 28, the tireless Ugaki and Sugahara managed to put 100 kamikaze into the air. Four of them were Baka bombers. On the first day, they struck at dusk with fighter escort, inflicting only minor damage on four near-missed destroyers. But at 8.41pm, the hospital ship Comfort sailing southwest of Okinawa with a full load of patients on a clear night and during a full moon with the ship lighted according to the Geneva Convention. The convention, which by policy and preference the Japanese never observed, was deliberately dive-bombed by a kamikaze. The pilot was well aware of the privileged status of his target, having dived at it in a preliminary run, before pulling up and banking to dive again. His plane and bomb crashed through three superstructure decks before exploding in the surgery compartment. Comfort did not sink, nor was there any panic. By a miracle of exemplary calm and the efforts of firefighting and repair crews, and despite casualties of 30 eliminated and 33 wounded, some of these either sick or wounded patients. The hospital ship was able to remain seaworthy while the repair crews dealt successfully with fire and flooding. Captain Aidin Tooker took all precautions, swinging out undamaged lifeboats on weather decks and deliberately darkening his ship against the possible onslaught of another predatory kamikaze and was thus able to make Guam in safety five days later. The next day, the B-29s, in vengeance, it is to be hoped, scorched and scourged enemy fighters on Kyushu, leaving few escorts for the 33 self-terminators bound for Task Group 58.4 one of two fast carrier groups still off Okinawa. Finding the Americans, two Zero self-terminators dove out of the sun on destroyers Haggard and Ullman. By bad luck, a 40mm shell from Ullman hit Haggard's main gun computer, leaving its five inches useless. Fortunately, both Zeros missed, but then another kamikaze crashed Haggard's starboard side, detonating a 550-pound bomb against her forward engine. A second self-terminator missed Haggard by ten feet, but then, as Hazelwood came to her assistance, a third scored a direct hit on her main deck that eliminated Commander Volkert Dow and 45 officers and men. Hazelwood remained afloat, but Haggard had to be towed to the Keramas. Upon its arrival, Haggard's skipper Lieutenant Commander Victor Sobalo and all other hands on deck gaped in amazement and dismay at what they beheld in the anchorage. 
If not exactly a graveyard of ships, it was at least a hospital emergency room stuffed with every category of floating cripple. Destroyers and all types of smaller ships, minesweepers, tenders, destroyer escorts, landing ship mediums, landing craft, tank, in every stage of wreckage or disrepair were everywhere. Some had lost their masts. The smokestacks of others were either crumpled or missing. Twisted guns hung over gunnels like broken teeth or were pointed uselessly upward. Superstructures were caved in while in the sides of dozens of other vessels were gaping, jagged black holes, some of them covered by makeshift cofferdams looking like blisters. While missing bows were sometimes similarly protected against flooding, or else had been jammed up against sagging bridges like steel accordions. Commander Sabale's heart sank when he saw how many damaged vessels were in line for repairs ahead of his own. It could be weeks or more, and then by the time Haggard would be ready to enter the floating dry dock. It might be discovered that she could not stand the flooding of just one more compartment, and thus could not be repaired at all. So Sabale ordered his crew to turn to, to improvise and scrounge and cannibalize and invent and borrow that universal service euphemism for pilferage or pinching, whatever they needed but could not obtain by requisition. This required not only skill-fingered sailors, but light-fingered ones. There were enough of the first kind among Haggard's welders, electricians, steam fitters, carpenters, and the other technical mates needed to run a modern warship, and a superabundance of the second kind among Bosun's mates and ordinary deckhands. The light-fingered details scrounged or borrowed enough scraps and pieces of lumber and other materials needed to patch a hole twenty by eighteen feet where the self-terminator had crashed. Another hole through which seawater had flowed to flood engine and boiler rooms was plugged. Sobale and others put on diving equipment to cover it with a seven-ton temporary patch, after which the rooms were pumped out. Meanwhile, the black gang ingeniously rebuilt an afterboiler from fragments of a wrecked one, using whatever scraps that would fit to repair steam lines to the engines. So resurrected, lighting off one boiler, the crew got their beloved ship underway, and in four months sailed her halfway around the world to the Norfolk Navy Yard. On April 29, Emperor Hirohito's birthday and the most important holiday in Japan, Lieutenant General Mitsuru Ushijima summoned his top commanders to his headquarters in a tunnel underneath Shuri Castle. For days they had been privately arguing over Isamu Cho's proposal for a massive counterstroke against the Americans. Now Ushijima wished them to discuss whether or not his strategy for defending Okinawa should be changed. Some historians say Ushijima was not present, others insist that he was. It does not seem likely, however, that the 32nd Army commander, even though it was not his custom to attend staff discussions, would ignore such a momentous meeting called by himself. Ushijima's chiefs sat on canvas camp chairs at a rough flat table covered with maps. Around them the stones of the tunnel glistened with sweat. Water from the moat surrounding medieval shuri seeped through crevices in the wall or dripped incessantly on the floor of beaten earth. Dim light glinted weakly off the glasses worn by most of the officers in attendance or winked on the stars of the numerous generals present. Isamu Cho sat close to Ushijima, staring arrogantly into the questioning gaze of his arch-rival, Colonel Hiromichi Yahara. Just as he had predicted the debacle of General Cho's abortive counter-attack of April 12 to 13, the rigidly rational Yahara was now prepared to oppose what he knew would be a plan for an even greater and more disastrous counterstroke. By his patrician bearing, he made it clear that he could not be bullied by either the rank or the fiery rhetoric of the burly general now rising to address the meeting. Cho began with an incredible untruth, that the Japanese soldier, in the main from four to six inches shorter than his American enemies and from thirty to fifty pounds lighter, was a superb hand-to-hand -hand fighter who could easily overpower the soft, effete American devils. A general clearing of throats and grunts of approval followed this absurd remark, either born of the school of the rosy report or emanating from the sake bottles being passed freely around. Very quickly, most of the commanders present supported Cho's plan. Lieutenant General Takeo Fujioka, commander of the 62nd Division, and also the plan's co-author, Lieutenant General Tatsumi Amamiya, swallowing his detestation of the boastful Fujioka in his eagerness to lead his untested 24th Division into battle at last, and Major General Kosuke Wada, 
chief of the 5th Artillery Command. Wada agreed with the others that the 32nd Army had made an achievement unprecedented in Pacific warfare. It had preserved its main body intact after a month of fighting. This, Yahara bluntly interjected, happened only because the Americans had not yet hurled their full strength against the Nahashuri Yonabaru line. But now that the outer defences had fallen because of the April 12 to 13 fiasco, the American commander was strengthening his assault forces, according to intelligence reports. An even bigger disaster would ensue if Cho's massive counteroffensive were approved, he warned. And to speak of the valour of the troops was foolish, because even now, since there had been no issue of sweet potato brandy on the Emperor's birthday, the men were discontented. For thirty days these gallant men had risen every morning to look down upon a Hagushi anchorage still choked with enemy ships. The divine winds had not blown them away. It was difficult for even Japanese soldiers to believe that the navy would come to their rescue, nor could they be blamed for complaining about being asked to fight alone one day's sail from the homeland. It was true, Isamu Cho replied slowly, that the Americans had not thrown in all their strength, but they were doing so now. There was a new marine division in the enemy's assault line. The first, the hated butchers of Guadalcanal. Another, the sixth, was due to join them. This was the moment to destroy the Americans' fresh power. But, Cho continued, the 32nd Army had also been reinforced. Had not our chief general Ushijima, in his wisdom, concluded that the enemy was not interested in storming the Minotoga beaches, and so had ordered our comrades of the 24th Division and 44th Brigade to join us here? Now it is we who are at full strength. Let us strike the enemy immediately and annihilate them before they can grind down to our main line. Careful, full-scale counter-attack, not the glory of the Banzai, would crush the Americans. There must be help from the kamikaze, then massed artillery fire with the troops attacking all along the line. The fresh 24th Division would be hurled at the centre and open a hole through which the 44th Brigade would pour in a thrust to the west coast. The 44th would then wheel south and the 1st Marine Division would be isolated and annihilated. The American 24th Corps would be rolled up, there should also be counter-landings on both flanks. The 26th Shipping Engineer Regiment would embark from Naha in barges, small boats and native canoes to strike the rear of the Marine Division. Later, the youths of the 26th, 28th and 29th Sea Raiding Squadrons would cross the reef and wade ashore to help the engineers. A similar counter-landing would strike the rear of the 7th Infantry Division on the east. It would be difficult to conceive a more complicated plan of attack and Cho's proposal calling for so many disconnected and disparate sallies. It was a montage of uncoordinated sorties, if ever there was one, paid absolutely no heed to what the enemy's reaction might be. Moreover, it was made doubly difficult by the Japanese unfailing reliance on a night attack to cancel out the American superiority in artillery, even if this meant confusing their own troops. Yet when Colonel Yahara arose to criticise the operation, he praised it as tactically excellent, probably because he was about to demolish it as a strategic monstrosity and did not want to alienate Cho entirely. Yahara said, To take the offensive with inferior forces against absolutely superior enemy forces is reckless and will only lead to certain defeat. We must continue the current operation, calmly recognising its final destiny, for annihilation is inevitable no matter what is done, and maintain to the bitter end the principle of a strategic holding action. If we should fail, the period of maintaining a strategic holding action, as well as the holding action for the decisive battle for the homeland, will be shortened. Moreover, our forces will inflict but small losses on the enemy, while on the other hand, scores of thousands of our troops will have been sacrificed in vain as victims of the offensive. Yahara sat down. It was now up to Ushijima. He nodded to Cho. The attack would begin at dawn on May 4. Before that, the flank counter-landings would be launched. Before them, the artillery would commence, and before everything would come the kamikaze. The Japanese aerial assaults began at six o'clock on the night of May 3. Once again, the bombers sought to get at the rich pickings in the Hagushi anchorage, but 36 of them were shot down and the rest forced to unload at high altitude, with little damage. Only the self-terminator diving kamikaze broke through. They sank destroyer little and an landing ship medium, while damaging two mine layers and an landing craft support. After midnight, 60 bombers struck 10th Army rear areas, 
coming in scattering window. Terrible anti-aircraft fire rose in crisscrossing streams of light, as though a million narrow-beamed searchlights were aimed into the night, and the bombers dropped their loads aimlessly, though some of them landed in a marine evacuation hospital. An hour later, marine am tanks guarding Machinato airfield on the west coast fired at voices on the beach. American cruisers, destroyers and gunboats on flycatcher patrol shot at squat Japanese barges sliding darkly up coast from Naha. The barges lost their way. Instead of landing far enough north to take the marines in their rear, they veered in shore and blundered into the outposts of B Company, 1st Marines. The Japanese sent up a screeching and gobbling of battle cries, and the surprised marines sprang to their guns. All up and down the sea wall the battle raged, with marine Amtraks moving out to sea and coming in again to grind the Japanese to pieces between two fires. Some 500 Japanese died in this futile west flank landing. The east flank landings came to the same annihilating end. Navy patrol boats sighted the Japanese craft. They fired at them and turned night into day with star shells. Soldiers of the 7th Division's reconnaissance troops joined the sailors to complete the destruction of 400 men. At dawn, the main attack began. It went straight to the doom that Colonel Yahara had predicted. Wave after wave of the 24th Division's men shuffled forward to death in that grey dawn, moving among their own artillery shells, taking this risk in hopes of getting in on the Americans. But the soldiers of the 7th and 77th Divisions held firm, while American warships, 16 battalions of division artillery, and 12 battalions of heavier corps artillery, plus 134 airplanes, smothered the enemy in a wrathful blanket of steel and explosive, ships as big as the 14-inch gunned New York and Colorado, as small as gunboats with 20mm cannons, ranged up and down the east coast firing at the Japanese on call. Across the island, the kamikaze dove again on ships in the Hagushi anchorage, again falling on the luckless small vessels of the radar picket screen. With them were the Baka bombs. This May 4-1 of the Baka hit the light mine layer Shea and set it temporarily on fire. The Kamikaze also sank two more destroyers, Luce and Morrison, as well as two landing ship mediums, while damaging the carrier Sangaman, the cruiser Birmingham, another pair of destroyers, a minesweeper and a an landing craft support. Again, they failed to get at the cargo and transport ships, and they lost 95 planes. Ashore, Isamu Cho's massive counterthrust was being broken by that material power for which Mitsuru Ushijima had shown such profound respect. Much of the Japanese assault died a borning. Sometimes the Japanese closed, but rarely. There were seesaw battles up and down some of the ridges held by the 77th, but they ended with the GIs either in command of their previous position or holding new ground farther inside the Japanese territory. One battalion of the Japanese 24th Division got behind the 77th on the left, but it was annihilated by a reserve battalion of the 7th Division in a three-day fight. Otherwise, the 24th Division never punched that hole through which the 44th Brigade was to race and isolate the 1st Marine Division. And the 1st began attacking on the morning of May 4. Even as the GIs on their left bore the brunt of Cho's big sally, these marines were battling southeast toward the key bastion of Shuri. They scored gains of up to 400 yards. The next day they attacked again, once more pushing the Japanese back, even though their advance was made more costly by the fact that they were up against rested battalions of the Japanese 62nd Division. By the night of May 5, the marines had picked up another 300 yards. By that time, Lieutenant General Isamu Cho's massive stroke had been completely shattered. Those two days of fighting had cost the Japanese 6,227 dead. The 7th and 77th Divisions had lost 714 men eliminated or wounded while holding the line. The 1st Marine Division had taken losses of 649 men in the more costly business of attack. The next day, the 1st gained another 300 yards and added a 4th Medal of Honor winner to its roles since coming into the line on May 1. That day, Corporal John Fardy smothered a grenade with his life, as had Private First Class William Foster. Sergeant Elbert Kinzer did it on May 4. Two days before that, Corpsman Robert Bush had risked his life to give plasma to a wounded officer, driving off a Japanese rush with pistol and carbine, eliminating six of the enemy and refusing evacuation though badly wounded. 
there would be more medals of honour won in the days to come. The first division by May 5 had come against Ushijima's main line, as had the GIs on their left. In front of the first was the western half of the Shuri Bastion. To their right was Naha, and this would be assigned to the 6th Marine Division the next day. In the sector of both these Marine Divisions were systems of interlocking fortified ridges, such as those encountered on Iwo Jima. Nor would the way be made easy here by further counterattack. A change had taken place at Shuri Castle. In tears, Lieutenant General Ushijima had promised Colonel Yahara that from now on he would listen to no one but him. The Ushijima-Cho relationship had ended in the recrimination of a red and useless defeat. Isamu-Cho argued no longer. He became silent and stoical, convinced now that only time stood between the 32nd Army and ultimate destruction. One of the still unexplained puzzlers of the Battle for Okinawa is why Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner allowed two veteran Marine divisions to stand idle in the north, the first for a month, the sixth for nearly two weeks, instead of using them to relieve one or two army infantry divisions badly battered in his three-division assault on the Nahashuri Yonabaru line. The answer, unpleasant though this speculation may be, seems to be that Buckner wanted the army infantry to have the honour of crushing the Japanese 32nd Army. There is nothing especially biased or prejudiced in such an attitude, and it is actually much more common among commanders of rival services than is generally understood. A similar decision by a Marine general occurred when Major General William Rupertus, commanding the 1st Marine Division at Peleliu, hesitated much too long before relieving his crippled 1st Regiment with a regiment from the 81st Infantry Division. He did it only after order to do so by Major General Roy Geiger, who was commander of the 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps. But Buckner's reluctance was somewhat more surprising in that the 1st Marine Division was probably the most experienced fighting formation in the American Armed Forces. 70% of the 6th, though new to battle as a unit, was composed of veterans from other divisions in other campaigns. It was not until April 28 that Buckner decided to put fresh troops into his renewed Down Island offensive. The 7th would remain in place on the left, and the 96th would be relieved by the 77th. The 1st Marine Division would relieve the 27th Infantry Division on the 77th's right, with the 6th Marine Division holding the western flank. Thus the line, 7th, 77th, 1st, 6th, 24th Corps, 3rd Corps. Almost simultaneously with this realignment, there arose a dispute over a proposal made by Major General Andrew Bruce of the 77th. Just before Cho's counter-attack, Bruce had suggested that his division envelop Ushijima's rear by storming the Minotoga beaches below him. On Leyte, Bruce's 77th had made a strikingly successful landing behind the Japanese line at Ormok, where the 77th rolled a pair of sevens, and he was confident he could do the same on Okinawa. Once ashore, his division could either move inland to take Iwa, a road and communications centre on the island's southern tip, or push north to join the 7th near Yonabaru. Buckner gave no serious consideration to the suggestion after his supply officer, Brigadier General David Blakelock, reported that though he could supply food for the operation, 10th Army had not enough ammunition to spare for it. On the last count, Blakelock's analysis was correct for even 10th Army's splendid service of supply had not yet been able to compensate for the loss of those two ammunition ships on April 6. Buckner was also aware that 10th Army planners had rejected the Minotoga beaches before L-Day. The reefs were too dangerous, the beaches inadequate, and the area exposed to strong enemy counter-attack. Beach outlets also were commanded by a plateau, and Bruce's landing would be too far south to receive support from Hodge's corps in the north and was also out of range of his artillery. These were indeed daunting considerations, although hardly more formidable than the drying reef and seawall at Tarawa, or even the reefs and seawall at Hagushi. Other division chiefs besides Bruce supported his proposal, although not necessarily to be executed by his division. Major General Pedro del Valle of the 1st Marine Division believed a Minotoga landing was advisable, although it should be made by the more experienced 2nd Marine Division, still in 3rd Corps Reserve. Major General Lemuel Shepard of the 6th said later he had suggested use of the 2nd several times to Buckner, pointing out that the logistics argument did not apply to this formation, 
because it had enough beans and bullets of its own to sustain a thirty-day assault. A landing by the second, he wrote later, would have seriously threatened Ushijima's rear and required him to withdraw troops from the Shuri battle or employ his limited reserve to contain the landing. Army historians of Okinawa in their book on the campaign were agreed that Minotoga would have produced logistical difficulties and might have failed, but only if it were attempted before the end of April. If made after May 5, the date that Cho's abortive counterstrike was shattered, it could not have been opposed by more than two or three thousand men. Colonel John Garrard, 10th Army Operations Officer, had learned by late April of Ushijima's order for the Japanese 24th Division and 44th Brigade to move north into Shuri, where they joined Cho's assault. This left Minotoga lightly defended, and Garrard, who had originally opposed a landing there, now strongly recommended it. So did General Hodge, who went to 10th Army headquarters to urge Buckner to envelop the enemy there. But the 10th Army commander did not agree again basing his rejection on the logistics argument, even though he now knew that the 2nd Marine Division could operate for a month on its own supplies. Buckner's decision became highly controversial in the stateside press, even before the Okinawa campaign had ended. Such influential newspapers as the Washington Star and the New York Herald Tribune, probably at the urging of Admiral King, flatly stated that the secondary landing should have been made. Some historians in defence of Buckner have suggested that if the 10th Army commander had even suspected that the Okinawa fighting would continue through May, and then for almost another agonising month in June, he might have preferred to risk a quick end to it by landing in Ushijima's rear. This is a specious argument, the purest conjecture apparently based upon nothing more substantial than a desire to exonerate the 10th Army commander for having failed to take what can only be described as a gamble with little risk. All the odds after May 5 were in Buckner's favour, an inferior foe defending against his own superiority in the number and quality of his troops, as well as in supply and in control of the air above and sea surrounding Okinawa. Caught between four American divisions to his front, with another in reserve and a garrison division also available behind them, and in his rear a 7th Veteran Division, pounded from land, sea and sky, hopelessly isolated and cut off from reinforcement or supplies. With the Kikusui attacks of no help on land, Ushijima's 32nd Army could either be starved into submission, or, if surrender was still so unthinkable to samurai such as Ushijima, Cho and Yahara, compelled to make a final glorious sally that would be broken in blood, ending in mass self-terminator. Meanwhile, with the Minotoga opportunity rejected as unfeasible, General Buckner still had to face the growing and open disenchantment of Admiral Spruance and Turner with the slow progress of 10th Army on land. Turner had repeatedly urged on Buckner the necessity for a quick conquest to relieve the terrible pressure of the Kikusui on the concentration of American ships off Okinawa. For such a huge body of vessels to remain so long as plainly visible targets of a self-terminatory enemy was indeed unprecedented in military history. This, of course, was not entirely the fault of General Buckner, but rather enemy policy, in a sense, to bleed all over the Americans and thus drown them in Japanese blood. Again, this was small comfort to either Spruance or Turner. Buckner's reply to the expeditionary force commander was that he was moving slowly in an effort to save lives. To Admiral Spruance, this was not a convincing argument, for he wrote, I doubt if the army's slow, methodical method of fighting really saves any lives in the long run. It merely spreads the casualties over a longer period. The longer period greatly increases the naval casualties when Japanese air attacks on ships is a continuing factor. There are times when I get impatient for some of Holland Howlin Mad Smith's drive. Spruance was right. Lives are definitely not saved by a carefully slow assault. They are merely spread out in time, but in the end the number of casualties is the same, or almost so. If an assaulting unit comes to, say, an enemy .47 anti-tank position protected by machine guns, thus making it impossible for supporting tanks to advance, and decides to call for artillery to knock it out before attacking, in the subsequent assault, it will almost certainly discover that shells simply cannot pulverise strong and clever defences. Foot soldiers will still have to go in there with hand weapons, with flamethrowers, grenades and satchel charges, and the time lost waiting for artillery to destroy the position will have been wasted, and their casualties will be the same as if they had attacked instantly.
Even General Buckner himself on May 1 had acknowledged at a press conference that Okinawa would fall only to tactics he described as corkscrew and blowtorch, the corkscrew being explosives and the blowtorch flamethrowers and napalm. But all of these have to be aimed, aimed close up, visible. They cannot be fired from a mile or more to the rear in an arc, which would be like skipping stones on water. Because every defensive position has a mouth or aperture through which its weapon can be fired, bullets, grenades, satchel charges or flame have to be hurled, thrown or squirted through these openings. Again close up. Even napalm will skid, and because it is always dropped from an airplane, it has about as much chance to enter a foot-by-foot foot or even a two-feet-by-two-feet two feet opening as has a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Go ahead, ask the question, what's the difference, slow or speedy, if the results are the same? The answer is that the time lost will extend the exposure of a supporting fleet such as Spruances to the assaults of the Kikusui, and also delay the departure of such naval forces to participate in another amphibious invasion elsewhere or release the fast carriers to strike homeland Japan. Finally, slow, careful land assaults could delay the entire Pacific timetable to the great pleasure of the enemy, for the one thing Japan could not afford to waste in the spring of 1945 was time. Spruance and Turner could not forget what had happened to the escort carrier Liscombe Bay at Makin, when 6,500 GIs moving slowly took a week to conquer a weak position in an operation that should have been finished in hours. Ordinarily, Liscombe Bay would have been long gone from the impact area, but the ship was sunk on the last day by an enemy submarine, with extensive loss of life. Similarly, because of slow progress on Okinawa, ships and many seamen and seagoing marines were being lost daily on the Hagushi anchorage. The admirals were also anguished by and ever mindful of the ordeal of their men, these unsung heroes, aboard those exposed ships, especially those of the radar picket line scourged by hundreds of kamikaze and baka. Men were horribly burned. They were blown into the ocean, either to drown or pass agonizing hours awaiting rescue and the ministrations of medical corpsmen. Those who survived the self-terminator's screaming dives went for days on end without sleep, their nerves exposed and quivering like wires stripped of insulation. Lying wide-eyed on their bunks, they waited to hear the dreaded telltale click and static of the ship's bullhorns being activated, like a starter's gun sending them leaping erect and running so that they were already in motion when the shrill, strident notes of general quarters burst in their ears. Men in the boiler rooms worked in intense heat. The superheaters, built to give the quick pressure needed for sudden high-speed manoeuvring under aerial attack, were often kept running three or four days at a time, though they had been made for intermittent use. But it had to be that way, for war off Okinawa was war at a moment's notice. Very little time separated that moment when radar screens became clouded with pips of approaching bogies and the shrieking self-terminators came plunging to the attack. An attempt to give the crews more warning of enemy approach had to be abandoned, one war correspondent reported. The strain of waiting, the anticipated terror, made vivid from past experience, sent some men into hysteria, insanity, breakdown. Similar reports reaching Admiral Nimitz led him to request from MacArthur the return of most of the ships of the Seventh Fleet he had so generously loaned the Southwest Pacific Chief at the start of the late campaign. He wanted to relieve some of Spruance's ships. But MacArthur had already protected himself against compliance with this agreed-upon condition by deliberately committing these vessels, as well as the 11th Air Force and the 8th Army, to a useless campaign in the southern Philippines in order to prevent their scheduled transfer to Nimitz. Such tactics, of course, were nothing new in World War II. During the Battle of the Bulge General, George Patton deliberately committed his beloved 4th Armoured Division to an unnecessary battle to prevent its being taken from him by General Omar Bradley. Bradley had already commandeered his 10th Armoured Division, but MacArthur's move was the soul of ingratitude for Nimitz's generosity, and it was compounded by the General's return to his old, discredited theme of minimal losses by comparing the ease and low casualties of his southern Philippine campaign, again against mud and logs and fragmented troops, to 10th Army's higher losses moving through steel, concrete and coral defences, manned by soldiers determined to fight to the death. Because of this typical MacArthurian selfishness, the scourging of the 5th Fleet continued. In fairness to Buckner, 
The defensive complex into which he was plunging straight ahead could not be reduced in any other way than corkscrew and blowtorch. But the attack could have been more impetuous and spirited, less dependent on what General William Westmoreland in Vietnam a generation later excoriated as the firebase psychosis, a tendency to stop at every obstacle and call for artillery. But it also must not be forgotten that Buckner summarily rejected the one opportunity for manoeuvre on Okinawa, the envelopment of Ushijima's rear by a landing at Minatoga. Why will never be known, for this able, considerate and dedicated soldier did not live long enough to write his memoirs, or at least an explanation of his position. But was the straight-ahead, annihilating attack the only solution to the destruction of Ushijima's remaining 60,000 men? Tenth Army had already secured and improved all the air and port facilities on Okinawa. For the Japanese, there was no way out, around, under, over or through. Did no one suggest cutting off the enemy to let him starve? Why not emulate Nimitz's island-hopping strategy in the Pacific, leaving enemy garrisons to wither on the vine by seizing the biggest and most useful islands while neutralizing those lying in between by aerial bombing? The Japanese could have been whittled and demoralized by constant aerial, land and sea bombardment, even goaded into those desperation back-breaking banzai attacks so attractive to the samurai character. Doubtless they would not remain completely contained, but would sally forth in typical night forays aimed at spreading terror and destruction. But this could have only minor success. It could never have inflicted casualties among the Americans comparable to what they suffered in Buckner's final straight-ahead assault. Nevertheless, perhaps because of the importunate appeals of Spruance and Turner, who, after all, were his superior officers, General Buckner did quickly schedule another grand offensive for May 11. The 96th Division back on line would be on the eastern or left flank, the 77th on its right, next 1st Marine Division, and then the 6th on the right, or western flank. General Hodge would command his 24th Corps troops on the left and would be the tactical commander of the entire front, with Geiger leading the 3rd Corps Marines. It was typical of Geiger, whose courtesy matched Buckner's, that he did not protest the selection of Hodge as tactical chief, even though he was his senior and about to receive his third star. This offensive was to be a continuation of the others with the same tactics, including the capable General Bruce's innovation of concentrating on a limited objective from which fire could be brought to bear on the enemy's reverse slope. Just before the jump-off date, however, the great Lu Chu's grey, growling and moisture-laden sky became the lord of the battlefield. On May 7, the skies of the Great Lu Chu opened with prolonged and torrential rains that reminded 1st Division Leathernecks of the month-long monsoon they had endured in the New Britain campaign. During 17 days of intermittent storms, some 15 inches of rain fell on Okinawa. Nothing could stand against it. A letter from home in the sodden pocket of a GI or Marine had to be read and re-read and memorised before the ink ran, and it fell apart in less than a week. A pair of socks lasted no longer, and a pack of cigarettes became watery and uninflammable unless smoked the same day, or else, along with matches, they were kept dry within a contraceptive inside a helmet liner. Pocket knife blades rusted together, and watches recorded the period of their own decay. Rain made garbage of the food. Pencils swelled into useless pulp. Fountain pens became clogged with watery ink, and their points burst apart. Rifle barrels turned blue with mould and had to be slung upside down to keep the raindrops from fouling their bores. Sometimes bullets in the rifle magazine stuck together, while machine gunners had to go over their belts daily, extracting the bullets and oiling them to prevent their sticking to the cloth loops. Everything lay damp and sodden, squishy and squashy to the touch, exuding a steady and musty reek that was the odour of decaying vegetation. To the Americans out in the open, unlike their enemies warm, dry and snug in their underground warrens. There were only three things of value to be found in this gurgling, gushing, rushing, streaming, dripping, drenching downpour that turned Okinawa's numerous narrow and shallow streams into raging, boiling, white torrents of water. A dry place, hot and solid food, and most of all, most unbelievably important of all, a hot cup of coffee. At sundown, before blackout discipline would be in force, among squads huddling together all over the island, tiny fires were made of the wrappings of cigarette packages and the waxed covers of K-rations, 
and water heated in a canteen cup containing grains of K-ration soluble coffee. Thus were their bellies fortified against another cold, black, rainy night. And the rain on Okinawa made Okinawa mud. It was unique because it was everywhere. In the ears, under the nails, inside leggings, or squeezed coarse and cold between the toes. It got into a man's weapons, it was in his food, and sometimes he could feel it grinding like emery grains between his teeth. Whatever was slotted, pierced, open or empty, received this mud. Wounds also. Men prayed not to get hit while rain fell and made mud. It embarrassed drivers of bulldozers and made pick-and-shovel coolies of those lordly tank troops. Some days it denied Americans the use of roads altogether, and GIs and Marines on the attack again often had to be supplied by airdrop. Frequently it was hardly possible to walk in it. A few strides and a man's shoes were coated and heavy with mud. Two more and they seemed as though encased in lead. A third step and it was easier to slip out of them before the mud sucked them off and walk in it barefooted. Engineers on the airfields actually put their shoes aside and worked in sacking drawn over their feet and tied around the knees. It was this mud in which the entire Tenth Army lay immobilised on the 8th of May, the day on which smeared and dripping marines and GIs received the splendid news that Germany had surrendered. So what? They